Although this is called Dr. Green Knight, I am not Dr. Green Knight, nor am I giving you any of the material of Dr. Green Knight. Just announcing that drgreennight.com is now live, even though I don't know if there's actually a... Yeah, I think there is actually the first post, so you can read it. Uh, I've been telling a lot of you about Dr. Gwaine Vaughn's blog that he's putting out with medical... medical... Uh, short medical writings, inspirational writings, informational writings, uh, giving you a bit of a look into the secret life in the mind of a medical doctor and the experiences they have, specifically Dr. Gwaine, the, the Green Knight. The name comes from uh, Sir Gwaine of the Round Table, who's called the Green Knight, so Dr. Green Knight, Dr. Green Knight, uh, K-N-I-G-H-T. If you guys are interested, check it out. Um, I don't even know if he has it set up to subscribe to it yet. Okay, who's, who's, oh, Lindsay, Lindsay, the first one. Okay, yeah, it's actually, his first entry is there now, entry, that's the word I was looking for earlier. His first entry is there now at uh, drgreennight.com. Look at it and, and let me know what you think. Lindsay, we are glad that you're a part of this, and we can just talk about that. And other people can bring up medical questions, we can talk to them. Yes, no, Jenny Locker, or yay, no, yay, no, yeah, no. Is that like kind of when people say, yeah, no, or no, yeah. And Claire is here. I'm glad that Claire's here also. We're glad to have you part of it. Mary Ranch, hello. Hello, Mary. Thanks for joining us. And we are open to medical questions on this live Auburn Medical Group video if you guys want to. Lindsay, I'd expect no less of classic Noble Monarchy for his blog. Yes, I, I very much agree that that's exactly what it is. And hello to Carl. Carl, I, Carl Coburn, I don't recognize your name. Uh, you maybe fairly new or not around as much as some of the others, so welcome. And good morning to Miss Merck 007. We're glad to have you be a part of things too. Uh, we can actually speak about the Powassan virus because some people are saying they want to hear. Hillary Allen, hey to you too, that they wanted to hear about that. Apparently it had been in the news, this uh, tick-borne illness that is in the Great Lakes, reg Great Lakes region and around uh, the northeast uh, very much, very much around where Boo Boo Kitty lives. It's uh, it's not a huge threat, though. It, I think in 2015 there were maybe 13 cases. And hi from Ireland for Cathal. We're glad to have you. And, and we also have um, Nils Wels uh, Wilkin. Hey, good to see you and glad to have you be a part of this. The uh, Powassan virus is a lot like other tick-borne illnesses like Lyme, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. You, you get bit by a tick, it stays on for a while, long enough to transmit the infectious agent, and then you get sick from it with flu-like symptoms. I mean, th th this is true for all of them to a large extent. Each of them have their own little different thing about them. Nothing really uh, remarkable about the Powassan virus that makes you know that that's what it is, except you got bit by a tick and you're having flu-like symptoms with headache, fever, tiredness, uh, nausea. And also, hi to Ninja Gaming 1234. And there is no specific treatment for it. They can use steroids if people have encephalitis and swelling on the brain. And I believe it's a third of people will have uh, permanent neurologic effects from it. So it's, uh, it's not that common, really not that common. It's rare for it to go into the double digits in a year for the number of people infected, but when a third of the people are seriously affected for the rest of the life, that's why it got so much attention in the news. I don't know if there's currently an outbreak or if a case happened to get in the news, but that's what the Powassan virus is all about. And Lindsay says there's been an increased awareness surrounding Lyme disease. Of course, uh, with it being the time of year that the ticks are coming out, and I like speaking on Lyme, particularly what I tell people is get the ticks off of you. It won't be a problem if you just because you got bit doesn't mean you get Lyme, even if it's a Lyme-infected tick. And uh, you just, you got to get the ticks off. So always check yourself. Um, don't let yourself go more than a day without, you know, either showering where you check your whole body or, or doing an inspection uh, if you're going to be out where ticks are. And you'll be okay. How do you get rid of a smashed nail and can animals get it? I believe that with the Powelson that they're, I'm trying to remember what the deal was. It's on deer ticks, um, same ones that would be concerned for carrying Lyme. And I don't know if the deer are a reservoir for it or not. Sorry, I can't help you that on that end of it. Uh, maybe somebody else knows and they can pipe in on that and help us out with that. As far as the smashed nail, 
Uh, if it's acute, you know, you just did it, you can get the blood out. If you, if you see blood under your nail and it's covering uh, a third of the surface area of the nail, uh, you, you want to get the blood out to help keep from having a messed up nail. And the way you do that is by coming up with a way of drilling through the nail uh, right where the blood is, just enough to get through the nail and the blood will spurt up. Don't do it in your house. It'll hit the ceiling. There'll be so much pressure and it'll immediately feel better. It will not hurt because of you drilling through it unless you're pushing on it. Uh, if you have something, something that can get through the nail without putting a lot of pressure on it, which would be like a sharp drill that's going through it or um, some people talk about using a red hot um, paper clip and I, I'm not so sure about that one so uh, I, I don't necessarily endorse that. There's, there's commercial products that doctors use which are great. Um, oftentimes I will use an 18 gauge needle and just twist until I get the hole made and if it's if it's a, a pretty good smash of the finger with a big hematoma under there, as soon as you get through, that blood will squirt out. The, the needle itself won't hit the area under the nail and the subunguum, and it'll, it'll just squirt out, let the pressure off, and that way the nail has a chance of growing normally after that. Uh, but if it's already happened, you know, oftentimes the nail will just come off by itself. Doctor, what's the test for Lyme disease? Uh, we don't... Interesting you bring up testing for Lyme disease. Uh, there is a test for Lyme disease, uh, blood test. The problem is it's got some false positives, and I believe the false positive, one of them is actually um, same test for syphilis. So th th there are problems with false positives. There are some people that say on the West Coast we need to have a different test and you can only get it from one lab. It sounds a little fishy and like... Uh, somebody's more interested in having something unique they can make money off of than that there's actually good science behind it. Uh, there are studies, of course, there's studies on both sides that conflict with each other. I know that the infectious disease specialists aren't really that hip on the supposed West Coast test that you can only get at one lab somewhere in the Bay Area. So I, 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 I hear two different voices on it, and I'll say I lean toward the infectious disease specialist on this rather than the more broad, newer Lyme disease uh, treatment and diagnosing that seems to be championed by family medicine doctors who take it upon themselves to be an expert in Lyme disease. Um, they, they do have some studies, and, and somebody who is better at reading the literature than myself really needs to look at that and tease out the two. Um, thankfully, I've not had to, with patients, direct them one way or the other in a way that's going to make the difference in their health um, on these issues. There's some people who will, you know, have them. Usually it's in another state because certain states kind of shut down these people that have these treatments for long-term problems with it. And, oh, my father-in-law is watching me on, the, on his phone. <laughs> I got a, an audience right here in the house. So I'll back up and look at some of the comments you guys were having there. So, oh, my goodness, you guys have really been giving comments. So if you guys want a comment to get through, you'll do use the live chat, the little dollar sign thing. That way I can, you know, address whatever you have right then and there rather than um, going on with somebody else's comments. So we've got Lindsay asking a random question about uh, being eliminate a virus, unable to eliminate a virus from the chicken such as chickenpox. Some of them go, some of them don't. Uh, we are able to eliminate some viruses. Chickenpox virus is able to live in the ganglia of your nervous system, a little structure that's kind of off the side of those, the uh, spinal canal and spinal cord. And Melissa, yes, always nice to see you, Melissa. Hindler Allen, what causes shingles, 17, and I have, I'm so sorry, it's a reactivation of the chickenpox virus that messes up the sensory nerves in that one um, somatic nerve that comes out from the spinal cord there, covering a little, an area about two inches wide, just one side of the body, front to back, midline to midline, or back to front, depending on how you look at it. And it will go away. Um, sometimes when people are older, the pain doesn't go away. The rash goes away, of course, within 10 days or so. 
but some people will have the pain go on and on and on. This happens more often the older you are, like people age 50 and older, about half of them that get shingles, the pain will stay. Age 70 older, about 70% of them, the pain will keep going on. Horrible situation. All right, back to Claire. Can you give me any info on a sundowner for Alzheimer's? That's a tough situation. Sundowning being when the sun goes down, people start having these behavioral problems. They're hard to direct. They'll be yelling out. They'll sometimes act violently. Difficult to deal with. The Alzheimer's medicines help up to a point. We don't recommend using the benzodiazepines like Ativan or Valium to shut them down. Um, those result in injury because when people are sedated, they don't have as good balance. They don't have quick reaction time, so they end up getting injured and falling. So the literature plainly shows that benzodiazepines are not recommended for people over age 65 and are not the recommended treatment for sundowning. As far as some acting out behaviors, we find that oftentimes we're asked for sedatives for demented patients for these acting out things. And if you, if you ask some questions, you'll find out that uh, it's really inappropriate to treat a person with chemical restraint in the given situation. For example, if... Uh, somebody is taking the patient and forcing them to get out of bed or go somewhere or get dressed or, or undressed and they don't want to, well, somebody who's not demented, would we just say that you need to drug them so that we can do those things to them? Um, that's assault. <laughs> so, no. Uh, but using medicines like uh, Seroquel or Quetiapine, an antipsychotic, in judicious dosing can help to, to mellow them out to a point that they're easier going. It doesn't just snow them and knock them out. It just uh, relaxes them, kind of makes it easier for them to work with. All right, Omar, glad to see you chatting again. Yes, thank you, Omar. We are glad to be doing it. And Hillary, is there any chance that the shingles will come out again in my life or once they are gone, they never try to emerge like actual rash? I'm sorry, rarely a person can have a second, even more rarely, a third, Occurrence of shingles, but it's rare. Now, what do you do when an ingrown toenail gets infected? Oh, gee, if it's truly ingrown, uh, using antibiotics to try to kill it off won't get rid of it because that edge of the nail, the sharp edge of the nail, is continually cutting into the skin. So you have essentially an open wound until you get rid of what's causing it to remain open, and that's the nail. So we take the nail off, or half of the nail. And that way that area can heal up before that next nail grows out over the following six months. And I apologize for the neighbor's lawnmower. I don't know if it makes it too hard to hear me or not. If it does, we'll have to quit. But uh, if you guys can still hear me, we'll keep going. And hey, Jeff, we're glad to have you be a part of things. Um, backing up a little bit, Melissa DiMartino Oh, I have a question about poison ivy. Is there homeopathic treatments or is medicine the best treatment? Let's talk about what homeopathy is. Homeopathy is taking whatever the offending thing is. So in this case, it'd be poison oak or poison ivy. And putting it in a solution and then diluting that solution and then diluting that solution. So serial dilutions to the point that there's no measurable amount of what you started with in the substance. And then taking that as a treatment for itself. So you take the offending thing. Dilute it with serial dilution to the point you can't even measure it, can't even detect it. And that's your treatment, the thing that's causing the problem. So they've got this whole theory about why it works. They even have homeopathic hospitals in Germany. And people uh, do get better from things when they go in there. But there's no uh, objective data to support that that actually works. When you do blinded studies... When you have anecdotal experiences, you see that, hey, this person got better when we treated them. That happens with lots of things, oftentimes not related to what the treatment was. So no, I don't recommend homeopathy across the board. I think that there's generous evidence that it's a bunch of bunk. I'll, you know, as I get older here, I, and, and as I study this more, and as I'm exposed to more and more things like homeopathy, I'm much more comfortable saying and making definitive statements. And I would say by all the evidence I've seen in the research and from people who have worked with it, I, I say don't even touch it. Uh, you know, if you just have, if it is poison ivy, which I'm not diagnosing it because that 
take something else. But once it's been diagnosed, it's in a healthy person, and that's limited area, just using over-the-counter hydrocortisone seems to be a good treatment for it. Uh, people who have more extensive cases of it, they'll benefit from taking oral prednisone. Uh, of course, that's limited to patients who don't have problems uh, that make them get sick because you gave them the prednisone, which can happen too. Uh, so, you know, it's patient by patient whether we decide it. Lindsay loves the video chats are outside. And we have a beautiful day here today, this Sunday afternoon, to do it. So why not? Here, let me tilt this up a little bit because I, I keep losing my forehead here. Well, you guys don't want to see my bald forehead, so eh, never mind. Uh, no super chat, so we'll just keep going to the regular chat and see what you guys are talking about. And Ninja Gaming 1234, what do you do when ingrown toenail gets a... Oh, we already talked about that, sorry. Uh, at least the neighbors aren't swearing. Ian, you remember last time. Yes, you are correct. And Beverly can hear us over the... Well, now it sounds like it's the blower rather than the lawnmower. That's okay. Claire, you're good so far. Hi, Christina Hartman. Omar, never asked you this. Are you a baseball fan? No, absolutely not. Mary Ranch, yes, we can hear you. Melissa DiMartino, wow, my husband keeps getting poison ivy exposure all the time. The answer to that is stop exposing yourself. Uh, Ryan, can you do a video on the role of a nurse in primary care? You know what? We're actually, in our office, able to get by having medical assistants do a lot of what a nurse would do. And then we have a registered nurse, Polly, who does mostly kind of supervising over the medical assistants and being the one that directs them to what to do. She's kind of like the, the doctor to the medical assistants as far as nursing care is concerned and does a lot of, sadly, a lot of administrative paperwork type stuff. I, I think she'd like to have more hands-on. I don't blame her for that. We, we get her into the rooms as much as we can to help out with nursing type things, with assisting and, and uh, wound dressing and uh, care for the patients. Sister has a wart for three years and done every treatment and still there. What advice? Well, if you've done every treatment, I guess all that's left is repeating one of those treatments. Um, but the real question is, has every treatment been done? Um, since you already declared that it is so, I, I would not take it upon myself to argue that you are incorrect. So we won't go into all, all the available treatments. And given the battery life and the neighbor's blower... We'll go ahead and wrap this one up, but I'm so glad to get together with you guys. I'm glad we're doing it more often here these last couple weeks, and we'll look forward to doing this again next time. Until then, Dr. Mark Vaughn telling you to stay in good